It's our Christmas Eve service, and happy Christmas to you. Uh, this service, like our service on Boxing Day, is being has been pre-recorded, so you're watching us um, from your television or your screen, and it can be seen on Facebook or on YouTube and on the website as well. Please take note, there will be no live service on Sunday. It is actually going to be on Boxing Day. But tomorrow is our Christmas Day service, and that will be here at the centre at 10 o'clock. It's a new time for us, 10 o'clock, so make that and make a note of that in your diary. The next service, as opposed to the pre-recorded ones, will be after Christmas, apart from Christmas Day, is on the 2nd of January, Sunday, the 2nd of January, at the usual time. Was it that, or is it the 3rd of January? Can somebody check that for me? Oh, well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that it's the 3rd, actually, but anyway, at the usual time of 10.30, so be back then. Today on Boxing Day, we'll be uh, telling the story of Christmas, the birth of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and the events that surround that time. It's the second. It is the second, I've been told. <laughs> Correct me on that one. Thank you very much. A future notice, um, for anyone that's interested, Alpha will be starting on the 11th of January, at, uh, that's Tuesday the 11th, at 7.30. And it's an opportunity to hear a little bit more about what it is to be a Christian and what it means to follow Jesus. Now I'm going to hand over to Ken and Bob, who've got a little ditty to tell us. Happy Christmas to everyone. Christmas. I'd just like to set the scene of what's happening. We're having some readings, but here's setting the scene. It's a group of people gathered together at Herod's Arms Bar in Jerusalem. It goes like this. Hello, stranger. What can I get you? For drinks, we have Jerusalem Jungle Juice. It takes the skin off your teeth. New wine or old if you prefer if the skins haven't burst. And a selection of Canaan cocktails. To eat, we have Dead Sea Stew. That'll float your boat. John the Baptist Locust Casserole. And Camel Street with Rice. You're not from around here, are you? I can see. Nice turban. No, I've just arrived with the Three Kings Camel Train. I'm a driver, been travelling for weeks. I was looking forward to a little relaxation in Jerusalem, but I gave her off again in the morning. Well, what's the Three Kings party doing here? Come to see Herod, I suppose. All the bigwigs, matters of state and all that. Well, they don't tell me much, but I think they're following a star. Uh, sorry? W wait a minute. Did you say a star? The Twinkle Twinkle variety? Yes, that's right, a star. Well, it takes all sorts in this world. Following a star, you say? Well, lately we've been hearing all kinds of <coughs> odd stories. Don't know what to believe. Perhaps you've heard them yourself. Can't say I have. So maybe you can tell me from the beginning. I have all the time in the world. By the way, I'll have the camel's feet. Well, it all starts way back in the midst of time. And it's all about God sending a Messiah, a deliverer, to rescue mankind. Before the Messiah was born, incidentally, we sometimes call him the Christ, it means the same thing, something, or rather someone, had to make an appearance. This is the one who the Jewish prophets had spoken about. They said he would be just like Elijah, same sort of character, fiery and tough. And his purpose in coming was to pave the way for the Messiah, prepare people for what or who was to come. Well, as you know, we are under Roman occupation here in Israel, Actually, the Romans have occupied most of the unknown world. They've set up a puppet king called Herod. Between you and me, a nasty piece of work. Nasty family, all of them. There was this priest married to a lady called Elizabeth. And it was the priest's turn to be working in the temple in Jerusalem. Just as he was offering incense, an angel appeared. This was a bit of a shock, you can imagine. I know he shouldn't have been surprised, being in the temple and all that, but he was. Anyway, the angel told him that your wife and you will have a child. They'd never been able to have children, and this child was to be the forerunner to the Messiah. 
To say that he was struck down was an understatement. Actually, the angel did that because Zachariah, that's the priest's name, needed a sign to believe it possible. So the angel said, you will be speechless until after the birth. named Mary. Mary lived in Nazareth in Galilee and she was betrothed to Joseph. Now betrothed means more than engaged. In fact she was sort of legally his wife, probably agreed on by the parents years before. They just hadn't had the ceremony or moved in together yet. Six months after Elizabeth conceived, Mary was sitting indoors alone and suddenly another angel appeared. This time he had a name, Gabriel. Apparently he is the chief angel. Mary, he said, you have been chosen to bring into the world the Messiah. He will save people from sin. He will have a kingdom that will last forever. Just as King David was great in Israel, he will be great everywhere for eternity. Well, you can imagine this was hard to understand for a young girl. How can it happen? She asked. I'm a virgin. God will do it supernaturally, said the angel. You have to admire Mary because she simply said, if God has chosen me, who am I to say no? Well, Joseph was not best pleased, I can tell you. Oh, yes, he said, amongst other things, when he heard the story, pull the other one. But because he was a compassionate man, and despite it all, he really loved Mary, he decided to go for a quick private divorce and enter this legal contract they were in to try to not bring shame on all of them. But enter the cavalry. What's this? Yet another angel? Yes. During a night time of tossing and turning, intermittent sleep, feeling a mixture of anger and resentment at being used, yet hurting because of the loss of Mary, came an angel. No name given this time. And he assured Joseph that all was as Mary had said. To cut a long story short, they got married but didn't sleep with each other while she was pregnant. During this time, Mary went to visit Elizabeth, and as she entered the room, amazingly, Elizabeth started to prophesy. She spoke of how blessed Mary was to bear the Messiah, and that everyone would know of her throughout history. Then Mary prophesied about God's faithfulness and fulfilling all his promises throughout the ages, culminating in what was happening. We call this prophecy, this prophecy the Magnificat. And the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy at the sound of Mary's voice. John was born shortly after. 
for that was the name the angel had given Zechariah. It broke with tradition. The family couldn't understand it. But at the moment of decision, Zechariah's voice returned to him and he told them his name will be John. John was to be known as John the Baptist and he doesn't figure again until Jesus starts his ministry. Now the Messiah's birth was quite different. The Roman emperor called Augustus wanted to know how many people he ruled so that he could tax them. So a day was appointed for all who lived in Israel to return to the place of their birth to be counted. This left Joseph with a problem because Mary was about due. He was bound to go to Bethlehem because he was an ancestor of King David. And this was where David's family line lived. So off they went to Bethlehem with Mary uncomfortably perched upon a donkey. Arriving late, they could find nowhere to stay until an innkeeper gave them permission to shelter in a cave he used as a stable for his animals. It wasn't long before the threatening labour got into full swing, and before dawn, the baby arrived. It was a little boy with a healthy pair of lungs. Joseph emptied a feeding trough called a manger, filled it with fresh straw, and laid the baby in it. Not the most auspicious start for one who is destined to rule the universe. In fact, you would think God could have been caught out by the birth, but no, it was typical of the Messiah to identify with the lowest. No one could say he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Where there's a story, there's always a backstory. And I enjoy reading and writing backstories to some of these situations. And here's one called A Different Perspective which is by someone who worked in the inn. <clears throat> I looked down and saw that the baby was crying. Well, why wouldn't it, being born in a place like this? I ask you, a hollowed out cave, cut out of the hillside, under a house, a place for the cattle and other animals to be kept in, smelly, damp, full of signs of neglect, and for a cradle, a cradle, an animal's feeding trough, admittedly lined with fresh straw, but a trough no less. The mother, recovering from the birth, wrapped in a shawl and being attended to by the innkeeper's wife. The husband, looking a little bemused by everything, still reeling from the rejection of his relatives. He was sure that one of them would have put him and his wife up overnight. But their abandonment to the streets when Mary was about to deliver the baby, was cruel in the extreme. All because she was, in their eyes, having a baby out of wedlock. The couple keep saying, but didn't the angel say that everything would be okay? Where is he then when we need him? As if all this was not enough, there was the issue of all the shepherds turning up with tales of hosts of angels telling them to, telling them to come here. At least they brought warm milk with them. And even more bizarre is the rumour that some foreign dignitaries are en route, although they probably won't arrive for some days yet. Where will we put them? I just, just don't know. What do they want? Where are they from? What have they to do with the birth of this baby? I have to say this has been one of the most unusual days in my life. I've only worked here in this pub, come in for a few weeks, most of the time it's straightforward, cooking, cleaning, serving, practical jobs, that sort of thing, working with the owner and his family. They're a kind couple, that's why they let the others use the stable. This census has brought in loads of business. The boss even gave me a little bonus last week because we've been so busy, but tonight takes the cake. A baby, born here in the stable. They somehow knew it was going to be a boy. Marvellous what doctors can tell you these days. I suppose it was one of them that told them. They already know his name. It's called Jesus, son of Joseph. But there's something very special about this one. If I were you, I'd keep an eye and a listening ear open about him. I wouldn't be surprised if he became known throughout all Bethlehem. And who knows, he may even be known as far off as Jerusalem. I don't know what for, but he's definitely special. 
Well, my break's over. It's back to work for me. Uh-oh, there's the front door again. Someone knocking. Who can it be this time? Nothing would surprise me after today. Well, bless my soul. It's blokes on camels. Now, that's not a sight you see every day. Here we go again. Can I help you? And it's no good you calling me my good man while your camel's doing that. I just cleaned that doorstep.
And while all of these things were happening in the hills around Bethlehem, something else was afoot. As usual, shepherds were guarding their flocks of sheep from thieves and wild animals. The nights were always cold, and so they would have a fire going, and were probably talking together, maybe eating or snoozing. Well, who should make an appearance? You've guessed it. Angels! Not one or two, but hundreds, and all singing and praising God. Although it terrified them at first, they couldn't help but get caught up in all the joy and good will, and sorry, and good will emanating from the angels as they sang about peace and God being pleased with men. After a short while, one of the angels peeled off and said to them, I've come to give you great news. The Messiah has been born in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem and you will find him in the stable in the manger. As soon as the angels had gone, they left their flocks and came to Bethlehem. When they found Joseph and Mary, they told them all the angels had said. And Mary, she stored all these things up in her heart. To 1660, it was banned by the Puritans. It was given various names. It was called the Twelve Days. That's why we have the song, the Twelve Days of Christmas. It was called Christ Mass. It was called Christ Tide. But they banned it. I suppose it's because I believe and love the fact that its message is central to everything that I do and am. So it's not just a happy fable designed to lighten our world at its darkest natural hour, but the celebration of an event that was and is destined to affect every life here. Why I celebrate Christmas is firstly because of its originality. There's simply nothing like it. It's a ripping yarn, fantastic story. A young couple, the wife is pregnant, they're forced on a journey against their will, the labour begins, the baby's on its way. There's a desperate search for accommodation which results in the loan of a cattle shelter where the child is born and placed in a feeding trough as a cradle. Jesus the baby, Mary the mother, Joseph the father. Why is this original? Haven't children been born like this before? 
yes, but not the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, God in flesh. This is better than Hollywood. It really is. And this is reality. So I love its originality. Why do I celebrate Christmas? Because of its spirituality. This story comes to us through the annals of time. But its events were preceded by ancient prophecies, telling us that God would send man a deliverer to save him from his folly, from sin and death. It runs through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The story is told there. The prophecies of Isaiah, it's in the writings of the Apostle Paul, they all speak of the Messiah, which means, incidentally, God with us. And yet, he would be rejected. But even in his rejection, he would accomplish everything needed to enable man to be reconciled to God. He brought about the cross. He dealt with the issue of sin. There was no help unless he came to help us. And he came with a purpose to die. This is his babe in the manger. But just before his birth, there are angels talking to Mary and Joseph and others. Shepherds are having divine encounters. Angels singing and proclaiming about the birth. The sheer otherworldliness of it all is wonderful. I love its spirituality. Why do I celebrate Christmas? Because of its practicality. How is this new family about to be pursued by a vicious, jealous, fear-ridden king going to survive? How is it going to happen? Believe it or not, by three wise men, astrologers, turning up on their camels, having followed a star and bringing with them gifts of great value for the new King Jesus. Gold, frankincense and myrrh. International currency. Not a euro in sight. This is God's practicality. Why do I celebrate Christmas? Well, because of its originality, because there's only one way to God through Jesus, the baby then, but the risen Saviour now. Because of its spirituality, because our problems are all in our relationship to the all-creating God. And practicality, because of the cross, Jesus dealt with everything that separates us from God the Father and makes it possible for us to know him. That's why I celebrate, believe in and love Christmas. What about you? Can you take these things on board, originality, spirituality, practicality, and see that God has done something on our behalf that we couldn't do for ourselves and it all started with a babe in a manger.
hope you've had enjoyed being with us this evening. And uh, just to say that if you have any questions, we have a book that's here all about Jesus. It's called Why Jesus? If you'd like to know some more, then if you make contact with us, we'd be delighted to send you a copy or give you a copy when you see us next. I'm just going to pray and we're going to give thanks to the Lord. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity we have today to worship you. Tomorrow we celebrate your birthday. And I want to pray, Father, as we enter into that tomorrow, we will all recognise and realise the reality is Christmas is all about you. Worshipping Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. So, Father, as we close this evening, as we enter into the rest of our Christmas Eve, I pray that you will bless every family that's watching here tonight, and that your blessing and your favour will be upon them now, in the name of Jesus. Amen.